If you're falling asleep, your legs are hurting, waiting for the lecture to end. <laughs> you're not going to be in bliss hearing Krishna Kata. In fact, you're going to probably suffer hearing Krishna Kata. <laughs> you're getting purified, but you're suffering and through the purification. But when you're eager, then the higher taste comes. And that eagerness comes when there is a serious sense of urgency. I need to surrender now. I've heard the philosophy. How many times I've heard this philosophy? Surrender to Krishna. Chant with attention. Become humble. You're not this body. Have you heard that? <laughs> and when we're told it, when you hear it again in class today, you're laughing. Yes, I've heard it so many times. <laughs> Nothing new. Tell me something new. <laughs> Give me some nectar. But when you're in a state of urgency, when there is serious danger, like a guillotine about to come down and sever your head, then you really have to surrender. Everything that we've been taking, everything that we've known, that we've taken lightly for so many years, it's an absolute necessity that wholeheartedly I surrender. I surrender to the holy name. I surrender to the Vaishnavas. I surrender to the deity. I'm not praying anymore as a formality. I'm praying for the, from the core of my heart and all the nonsense things that we're still attached to that we know we have to give up and we resolve to give up. But not now because I just like them too much. I know, before I die, I have to give these things up. But maybe next year. <laughs> but the problem is then next year comes. And we are even more attached to these things. Next year. Next year. Soon 10 years pass. 20 years pass. And we're still holding on to it, thinking, next year. Well, when you're giving a death notice or where your whole life is sh shaking due to a violent earthquake of circumstances around you, you realize, forget this next year. I'm suffering too much. I have to do it now. I have to take shelter of really reading these books, not just to, to get some information so I can speak and be popular as a good orator. I'm reading these books, every word of Srila Prabhupada. I need to hear it. And believe me, try it. If you read any purport of Srila Prabhupada with a sense of urgency, every word will just penetrate your heart and change your life. Because he's speaking to you. And if we have that sense of urgency due to a suffering condition around us, whether it's in kirtan or bhajan or japa, we understand, I have to absorb myself. I have to take shelter of the holy names. I have to give up my nonsense. I have to give up my complacency and cry out the holy names of the Lord. Bhishma continues. It is the power of inevitable time. Inconceivable and irreversible. And ultimately,
time is controlled by Krishna. Therefore, it is the plan of the Lord. The plan of the Lord is transcendental. It is beyond the material world, which means it's beyond all material elements to fathom, including the mind, the intelligence, or the ego. Even the greatest rishis, sages, and philosophers cannot comprehend the inconceivable plan of the Lord. But the plan of the Lord is always perfect and good for his devotee. This is where faith is so absolutely essential for our spiritual sustenance. Faith goes beyond the intellect. It goes beyond logical reason. Because the intellect and the logical reason cannot go beyond material consciousness. Krishna is transcendental. Piercing through all the limitations of material inebriates. The only way we could do that is through the access of faith. Krishna has spoken his love for his devotee. I may not understand it. I cannot understand it, but I know it's true. Krishna says it. The Acharyas say it. The scriptures say it. And I feel it in my heart, gradually, more and more. Faith is that substance where we can see the invisible, where we could connect in a very tangible way to the absolute truth, to Krishna. How important it is to cultivate faith. Shraddha. Ado shraddha sadhu sangotha pajana kriya. Rupa Goswami describes the very basic seed of our spiritual life is faith. That little speck of faith that Krishna awakens within us. And all the way to the ultimate perfection of prema, it's about simply the development of faith. Srila Prabhupada very simply tells how faith is developed by hearing in the association of those who have faith. Srila Prabhupada warned us not to be reading too many books just out of curiosity. Because if you hear so many different things from so many different people, your faith becomes very confused. It's not helpful. Yasya Devi para Bhaktir. One who has implicit faith in Guru and Krishna, all the, all the revelations of the scriptures are awakened within our heart. Faith is so important. We, have, we accept what is favorable for devotional service and reject what is unfavorable for devotional service. And a major part of that is to accept the association that increases and nourishes my faith and avoiding the association that plunders our faith. Even the greatest philosophers cannot understand the plan of the Lord. But... Bhishma tells you to steer Maharaj, you must follow the plan of the Lord. Do not feel guilty about what has happened. The, battlefield, the battle of Kurukshetra was ultimately the plan of the Lord. And Krishna's plan was so perfect for everyone. Now, it is your duty that Krishna has given you to be the emperor. 
The world is in chaos. There are helpless people who need your protection, need your guidance, and need your, gu and need your love. Don't lament. It's disturbing your devotional service. Perform your duty as the king. Krishna, Bhishma said, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's the absolute truth, the cause of all causes, the source of everything that exists, the father of all living beings. Even Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma, <coughs> Narada, they all worship the Lord, but none of them can understand him in full. And Krishna, out of ignorance, you were thinking that he's your relative, your friend, your servant, carrying messages for you. But realize that he's the ultimate goal of every life and the super soul in every heart. Being present in every living being's heart, Krishna is equal to everyone. He's impartial to anyone. And yet, Krishna has so graciously come before me at the time of my death. When Krishna comes before his devotee, he releases him from all bondage. And here is Krishna standing before me, so undeserving as I am, with his beautiful lotus-like face, his eyes which are reddish like the rising sun. At that time, Yudhisthira inquired from Bhishma about the essential principles of religion. Bhishma explained in great deal detail in the Shanti Parva of Mahabharat, which is hundreds of pages. Can you imagine laying at a bed of arrows speaking such eloquent philosophy? But as soon as Bhishma fixed his mind and his eyes on the beautiful lotus-like form of Krishna, he was so absorbed in the higher taste of Krishna, he was relieved of all pain and inconvenience, despite every part of his body pierced right through with arrows. He spoke on the Varnashram system and the duties of each particular person in human society according to their occupational and spiritual status. <clears throat> he spoke about the principles of morality, the principles of religion, how to overcome anger, how to be honest even in provoking situations, how to be loyal and faithful to our guru, to our teachers, to our seniors. He spoke all the codes of morality, ethics, by which a man or woman in any situation will live with the highest integrity. He spoke about chastity in great detail, about self-control, And he spoke about the duties of a king and how Yudhisthira in particular can keep his enemies subjugated and all of his subjects completely satisfied, both emotionally, materially, and spiritually. As Bhishma was speaking, 
he noticed the sun entering into the northern hemisphere, <clears throat> which according to the Sastras is a time that is very auspicious to die. Yudhisthira gazed at the beautiful form of Lord Krishna, meditated on the personality of Godhead. All his senses became still. He withdrew like a tortoise, withdraws his limbs within a shell. He withdrew all of his senses from the external world <clears throat> and fixed his body, his mind, his thinking, his feeling, his willing, his everything on the form of the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. There was nothing else that existed in the entire creation except Krishna for Bhishma at that time. And he spoke. Now let me invest my thinking, feeling, and willing, which were so long engaged in different subjects and occupational duties in the all-powerful Lord Sri Krishna. He is always self-satisfied, but sometimes, being the leader of the devotees, he enjoys transcendental pleasure by descending in the material world, although for him, only the material world is created. He remembered and offered his prayers to Krishna, who is the intimate friend of Arjuna, who in obedience to Arjuna's order drove the chariot between the two armies. And then Bhishma, he showed the world the perfection of yoga. He fixed his entire consciousness on Krishna's beautiful form. That form of Krishna, he said, whose face is like a blossomed lotus flower, whose eyes are like lotus flowers, whose complexion is most beautiful like a tamal tree, whose every limb is the treasure of the heart, and whose glittering golden garments are shimmering in the sunshine. That same Krishna who on the battlefield of Kurukshetra I witnessed with flowing hair that was covered by the dust raised by the hooves of the galloping horses and whose sweat like beautiful beads was covering his face. That same Krishna I am meditating on at this moment, whose body was decorated with the wounds inflicted by my own arrows. Srila Prabhupada explains how Bhishma, as a warrior, is meditating on Krishna according to his particular relationship with him. Bhishma is praying that on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna and taught the entire world for all time through that dialogue. And then when the battle was fought, 
because of his merciful glance, every single warrior on that battlefield attained their original spiritual body in Vaikuntha. This is how Krishna is the well-wisher of everyone. He is equal to all. Srila Prabhupada explains how because every single person of those millions and millions of people who died on either side, because Krishna glanced on them and they were able to see Krishna, they all remembered Krishna at the time of death. And the Bhagavatam explains, and Prabhupada cl clarifies that most of those warriors were egotistic. Some of them were cruel, sinful, unethical. If they would have lived a long life, they would have simply suffered miserable karma in the next life and in this life as well. But Krishna was so kind. Great life is not about living long. Great life is about going back to Godhead. They were all cleansed of all their sins, of all their, of all their piety also. By Krishna's merciful glance, he gave everyone the highest salvation. Bhishma is remembering this. The love of God And then Bhishma meditated upon Krishna, who to fulfill the promise of his devotee was willing to break his own promise. During the battle, Duryodhana, insulted Bhishma. And for a Kshatriya, it was intolerable. He's, he actually chastised Bhishma. Can you imagine the impudence of Duryodhana? He said, the reason why we have not won this war yet is because you, who is the commander-in-chief and the Kshatriya, are breaking the Kshatriya code because you have a soft place in your heart for the Pandavas. You are not destroying them. Bhishma said, all right, if you're going to say that, I have five arrows reserved to kill the five Pandavas tomorrow. Duryodhana said, let me keep those arrows safely until tomorrow. So Duryodhana took those five arrows. Krishna knows everything. <laughs> Nobody else knew. No, second per no third person knew. It was Bhishma and Duryodhana. But there's the witness within everyone's heart. And we should be very careful. What we say, what we promise, what we do. Even if there's a... If, in there, if there's a confidential top secret between two people, you should know somebody else knows. <laughs> and that somebody else is going to do something about it. <laughs> Whatever you need is what's going to happen. So Krishna tells Arjun, Duryodhana has these five arrows. Bhishma have already vowed to kill the five of you with these arrows. I cannot violate the vow of Bhishma. But if you go to Duryodhana as a, as a guest in his house, he has to give you whatever you want. Ask him for the five arrows. So Arjuna went at night, after sunset, the battle would stop. And sometimes even the enemies would have parties together. This is the days of the Kshatriya. 
And Arjuna came to Duryodhana's residence. Duryodhana said, oh, you are my guest. It is my duty to serve you. What can I give you? Arjuna said, give me those five arrows. <laughs> As a Kshatriya, Duryodhana already promised he had to give them to him. When Bhishma found out about that, he was ecstatically angry. <laughs> ecstatically means it wasn't like material anger. He decided he was going to get back at Krishna for this. But in a way that Krishna would be glorified for all time to come. Bhishma vowed that he, in order to keep his promise, Krishna would break his own vow. Because during the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Konteya pratijani hiname bhakta pranashiti, declare it boldly, Arjuna, I will always protect my devotee. And Krishna also said, before the battle began, he vowed, I will not lift a single weapon and I will not fight on either side. I will be a chariot driver and other than that, I'm neutral. He vowed. But Bhishma vowed, I'm going to make Krishna break his promise and he's going to pick up a weapon and fight. Hare Krishna. So that day, Bhishma was fighting so ferociously with Arjun. Arjun could not stand before him. Arjuna was utterly defeated by his grandfather, although he was trying his very best. He was practically laying there helplessly. And Bhishma was about to kill him. Arjuna had no way to survive. One moment later, he would have been dead at the hands of Bhishma. Seeing that situation, Krishna became as angry as fire. With his flowing hair covered by the dust raves by the hoods of galloping horses, he ran lifted up the wheel of the chariot and attacked Bhishma with eyes as red as burning copper. Bhishma saw Krishna as death personified and dropped his and started shooting Krishna's body with his arrows. Krishna was bleeding Now one may ask, for Krishna, there's no difference between his body and his soul. How is it that he was bleeding? How is it that there was wounds and he was being pierced by the arrows of Bhishma? Srila Prabhupada explains in this regard that Bhishma was a devotee who had pure love for Krishna. He was shooting these arrows as an offering of love. And Krishna, he was feeling them as offerings of love. Just like when you bathe Krishna with Abhishek, if you do it with love, it feels very nice to Krishna. Now, how many of you have seen Abhishekam ceremonies? How many of you would like thick honey poured over your head and all over your body in public? <laughs> How many of you would like to be bathed in ghee? And usually by the time they pour it over Krishna, it's not warm, it's kind of thick and golden, and it's just like pouring all over. And all kinds of milk and yogurt, and fruit juices. 
Would that be pleasurable to you? Then why do we do it for Krishna? Because when it's offered with love and devotion, it feels so wonderful to Krishna. Srila Prabhupada explains the arrows of Bhishma piercing Krishna's body felt like another devotee would shower flowers on Krishna. Why? Because Krishna is, his body is spiritual. Ishvara parama krishna sachit ananda vigraha anadira dira govinda sarva karana karanam. His body is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. Krishna speaks in Bhagavad Gita that the soul is transcendental to material energy. The soul cannot be cut into pieces by any weapon. It cannot be moistened by water. It cannot be withered by the wind. It is transcendental. It is beyond the scope or the reach of anything material. And Krishna is the supreme soul. And Krishna's body is non-different than his soul. Krishna's body is his soul. The Paramatma, the supreme, the source of Paramatma. So how could Krishna's body be pierced by weapons if he says the little tiny infinitesimal part and parcel soul cannot be pierced by weapons? He cannot be pierced by weapons. But in the exchanges of love, Krishna was accepting Bhishma's devotion in the form of these offerings and was reciprocating by bleeding. Hare Krishna. Now for many of you ladies, this is not the way you would want Krishna to reciprocate. But please understand, Bhishma was a warrior. There are five rasas or humors. Shantaras, Dasyaras, Sakyaras, Vatsalyaras, and Madhuryaras. Bhishma was in Dasyaras. He is an eternal servant of Krishna. But his particular mood of service was chivalrous. So this is how he's expressing his love for Krishna, by shooting arrows in Krishna. And this is how Krishna is reciprocating with his love, by being pierced by the arrows. And Bhishma is looking at this unbelievable form as Krishna is running at him with red hot eyes and a chariot wheel to kill Bhishma. This was the ultimate perfection of Bhishma's life. This was the form of God that Bhishma wanted to meditate upon at the time of death. Krishna coming at him to kill him with a chariot wheel, with his body pierced by his own arrows. Why? Because he saw it as Krishna's unlimited mercy upon him. Bhishma surrendered wholeheartedly right on the battlefield before Krishna. And the sun set just then. Krishna satisfied all the desires of Bhishma. And at the last stage of his life, he is remembering and meditating this supreme event of his life. Krishna broke his own promise and came attacking Bhishma like a lion comes to destroy an elephant. Bhishma prayed, at the moment of death, let me meditate on my ultimate attraction, Krishna, who's standing on Arjuna's chariot with a whip for whipping horses in his right hand and the rope to control the horses in his left hand. Let this be the ultimate attraction of my life. Let my mind be fixed on Krishna, who through his smiles and his loving gestures attracted the hearts of the gopis of Brajbhumi. 
those gopis who so intensely focus their entire hearts on Krishna in separation when he left them in the Rasa Leela. Herein, Bhishma on his deathbed, he understands his position as a servant, meditating on Krishna as Parthasarathi, but he's exalting the highest, purest of all devotees, the gopis of Vrindavan. In this regard, we should understand that the position of the gopis is so far beyond any material conceptions. It's the purest love. Srila Prabhupada explains how unfortunate it is for anyone to take the love of the gopis cheaply. To think that we could pretend we have the love of the gopis. The conjugal love of the spiritual world can only actually be approached, Prabhupada says, when we don't have a trace of sex desire in our own hearts. And we should be honest about this. The great Acharyas teach us the love of the gopis is our ultimate object of worship. We look up to it in the spiritual world and with folded hands reverentially hold that love on the top of our heads, praying to someday be qualified to approach it. Not just in our state, we just playfully think that we're like gopis and talk whimsically about the love of the gopis and about the intimate affairs of Krishna and the gopis. This is the most esteemed subject matter that Bhishma Dev himself is exalting, worshiping, and glorifying as being the ultimate highest. And this is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. That love of the residents of Vrindavan, the gopis, that Bhishma Dev, in his last moments on world, is worshiping and honoring from the core of his heart. Namo Mahabharanyaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gaurutve Shainamaha. Bhishma himself felt unqualified to understand the love of the gopis. But Lord Chaitanya is giving that love to everyone and anyone. No other incarnation has ever been so generous, so magnificent. How? Not through some cheap imitation but by being the servant of the servant of the servant and following in the footsteps of the six Goswamis. Following in the footsteps of the six Goswami means understanding the qualities of their life, their humility, their self-control, their absolute obedience to their gurus, their absolute dedication to the mission. their complete detachment from any sense gratification, their utter simplicity. This is the life of the Goswamis. If we follow in their footsteps and understand their literatures under the guidance of the spiritual master who knows how to present it according to time, place, and circumstance, then by Lord Chaitanya's mercy, we will achieve Vrindavan Dham as a servant of the servant of the servant of the gopis by simply chanting the holy names.
Bhishma Dev meditated on Yudhisthira's performance of the Rajasuya Yagya, in which Krishna was glorified as the greatest person on earth. Rajasuya Yagya is the most difficult of all sacrifices. You have to be an emperor and you send horses with representatives all over the world. And every single kingdom, every single governor has to surrender to you as the king and accept his obedience under the king. And if anyone doesn't accept total subordination and obedience to you to steer and be willing to pay the taxes to you to steer, then there's a war. You have to conquer all opposition. You have to conquer all, um, even not only opposition, but anyone who just even stalls from surrendering. There's a battle. And after the entire world accepts your supremacy, then you could do the Rajasuya Yagya. Hare Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada explains it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to do one Rajasuya Yagya. And Prabhupada wrote this in 1963 or something. So it would cost hundreds of billions of dollars by today's standard. Massive efforts. But Yudhisthira Maharaj only performed this Rajasuya Yagya for one purpose. Because the prominent feature of that is the Agra Puja. Where the most prominent, important person in the entire earth is glorified by everyone. Now during Krishna's pastimes in this world, not everyone knew that he was God. By his own yoga maya potency for his devotees and by his maha maya potency for the ordinary people. But Yudhisthira wanted the whole world to make ultimate spiritual progress by glorifying Krishna as the greatest of the great. Bhishma Dev was remembering this sweet relationship between the gopis and Krishna and then Yudhisthira Maharaj and Krishna. And then Bhishma concluded that Krishna now I can meditate with full concentration upon that one Lord, Sri Krishna, now present before me, because now I have transcended the misconceptions of duality in regard to his presence in everyone's heart, even in the hearts of the mental speculators. He is in everyone's heart. The sun may be perceived differently, but the sun is one. Srila Prabhupada explains, everything is Krishna. Nothing exists that is not Krishna. Because all material and spiritual worlds are simply the emanations of Krishna's energy emanating from Krishna. Therefore, nothing is separate from Krishna. Nothing is different from Krishna. Everything is Krishna. Krishna. 